117, Salon Management. What this course will consist of is a notebook with 35 criteria or objectives in it and one display. And I'd like to meet with you individually on the display. So let's go to it first. It should be number 22. It's create a display of products for a service. And what I want this board to be is I want you to think of one service you'd like to highlight. Maybe it's a service you're not doing a lot of in your salon and would like to get your business up or you would like to do it more. I want you to get some pictures out of magazines. Fix your display. Let's think of a slogan for it and put some pictures of that one service with our slogan. Then bring it in and we'll fix your board up, get you some products to put in in front of it for um, that service. Hopefully some of these products will be able to be used for retail so you can make a little money off the service and retail. So that's number 22. Now let's go back to number one to start. And I want this to, I want you to remember this is your salon. So some of the answers should be different from one student to another. I do not want them copied out of the book. If I'm going to copy out of the book, I could just run up there and make some copies. But I do want you to go to the last chapter in your book and also to use the salon management textbook in order to answer these questions. Number one, list areas in which a person must be knowledgeable to plan a salon. What would be one thing we'd have to be knowledgeable in to plan our salon. The services we going to do in our salon? We'd need to be knowledgeable in that, wouldn't we? What else do we need to be knowledgeable in? We need to know a little bit about bookkeeping, don't we? A little bit on how to keep our books so that we'll know what we're, what profit we're actually making, what's taxable. Just write me out some areas after you read to tell me what you must be knowledgeable to plan a salon. Number two is list things to consider in selection of a location for a salon. Now some of y'all might come right out and say, I just want it at my house, that's all. And that's okay. But you got to consider, can you do that? Is there a zoning law against it? So you got to consider that if you're going to put it in your home. If you'd like to have one next door to Walmart because you feel like there's so many people out there, that is fine. But can you pay the rent on a building right there side of Walmart and make any money yourself? Also, you got to consider about people parking. And if you're going to work some after dark, is there lighting on the parking lot? What is the general population of that area? Because you don't want to put it somewhere where there's not anybody that frequents the beauty salon. Number three is interpret precautions taken before signing a lease. Now, it's easy enough to put on there, uh, let the lawyer read a lease. But you just opened in a beauty salon. Can you f afford an attorney right off the bat? No. Look through that lease and find things that may be a problem. Then take it to an attorney and just get him to check those areas. One of the main precautions is to see how long that lease is and how long you're going to be locked into it. How often can the rent go up? Who will pay for repairs? Can you renovate? I had a student years ago to get into a lease agreement with this landlord had a good location the rent was relatively reasonable and she signed the lease got in there got ready to install her shampoo bowls and he didn't want any holes cutting the walls or the floors for the water lines or drain lines so there she is and what is a beauty salon without shampoo bowls so you got to ask, can you remodel? Another important question nowadays with all this booth rental is can you sublet it? Because often if you don't have that in the clause, he sees that you're renting a chair to somebody else. Wants the rent. It's his building. So check your precautions good. 
Number four is illustrate a layout for an open salon and a closed operator salon. We work in an open one out here in the lab floor. That means there's no petitions between individual operators. There is an illustration of an open salon in your textbook in the business management part of it. Draw me one. Don't forget the important things. Don't forget restrooms, dispensaries. Don't forget about your flow of traffic in and out the salon as you draw it off. Remember, you don't want your clients to come in the reception area and then have to go through your dispensary area to get to the restroom. You want to kind of keep your dispensary off of the beaten path for them. So keep all of that in mind as you draw the layouts for these salons. Number five is list important aspects of a well-planned salon. The first and one of the most important aspects of a well-planned salon is the flow of traffic in and out that salon. Take this, this department, um, for example. If they had the clients coming through this classroom, then we couldn't get much classroom work done, could we? They laid it out so that the clients come into a different area, into the reception area. The restroom is right there for them. So flow of traffic. Ease of operation in a beauty salon will be another one. How good is it for clients? So think about what it takes for yours to be well planned. Number six is secure copies of state, county, and city laws. And I want to start with state. I'm going to give you a website. I want you to go out on it, and it, it a day a little later on, you and I will go out on it and let me show you some of the things you can find. That website is www.sos.state.ga.us. When you click on that, it's going to open up the Secretary of State's website, and you're going to see these pictures along there. And one of them is going to be professional licensure. And when you bring your cursor over it, it will open up. The best thing to do is go to the home page and then go to cosmetology. And on the left-hand side of the screen, it's going to give you all the different things you can do there. What I want you to do, and don't print all these, I want you to look at the laws for cosmetology. And I want you to look at the rules and regulations for cosmetology. But there's one there on a caption. It's sanitary regulations for cosmetology. It's one page only. And that's the only thing you need to print and have in your book. The other I just want you to be aware of so you know what's going on in the state of Georgia as far as cosmetology is concerned. Now for your county and city laws. If you are planning on putting your salon in the city limits of whatever town, just call your city administrator. You don't have to do anything about the county. Just call the city administrator in that town and ask them about zoning, about licensing fees, and what anything else that would interfere with you opening a salon or would regulate you opening a salon. Number seven is list the types of ownership. And I'm going to call these out, but they're in your book, so don't try to keep up with me writing. But first is the individual. If you plan on owning your own salon, you're an individual. And you're going to make all the profits. You're going to bear all the loss. You're the boss. You get to make all the decisions. Then there's the partnership, where two people own the salon equally. They divide the losses, they divide the profits, and they have to get together for any decisions that are to be made. Then you have your corporations, and you have your chain-owned stores or salons. Number eight is identify sources of income. Now, don't sit there and put shampoos and sets and haircuts and chemical relaxers and permanent waves. Just put services. That will include all of that, hair, skin, and nails. Then put retail products if you plan to sell retail, and I hope you do. And some of you may get a tanning bed 
or you may sell a clothing line or a jewelry line. Some people may even sell Cokes and crackers or something like that for the clients to have while they wait. So include anything that you will make money off of or that brings money into the salon. Number nine, explain payroll procedures. Now, I, I have in the past gotten the comment that um, I'm not going to have any employees, so I don't need to have payroll procedures. You couldn't be further from the truth. That's right, yourself. And if you don't pay you, how long are you going to work for you? You're not going to be there very long, are you? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure to have some payroll procedures. In the book, it'll list seven wa several ways. One is on commission. That is the most popular. It's commission. But a lot of you salons, until a client can, or until a, excuse me, an operator can get a business built up, We'll pay them an hourly rate and let them do some of the duties around the salon or shampoo for the advanced stylist and then pay them commission for the clients they do. There's also commission on the retail products. You've got to see how to figure that. So come up with the payroll procedure that you're going to use in your salon. Number 10, this is standards everybody should look like, look the same on number 10. It, that lists the types of taxes to be filed and paid. You know, there's FICA, state, federal, sales tax. So just list all the types that need to be filed and paid. Number 11 is inventory salon supplies. Your salon supplies are the things that you have to replenish. You're constantly using them and using them up, and you have to replenish them. Shampoos, conditioners, all that. And the reason we want to inventory these is because if you've just opened your salon and you say, well, I spent $50,000 and I'm in the hole that $50,000, but this money was spent and you're not in the hole this part of it that's invested in supplies because those supplies are still sitting back there on the shelf waiting for you to use them. So it's like money that's sitting on those shelves. So uh, you need to inventory your salon supplies at the end of every year. I will give you a cabinet back there in the dispensary to inventory. On it, we want to write down the name brand, like Matrix or Redken or whatever. Write down the product and what size container it's in. And if it's not a whole container, kind of guesstimate. Is it a half or whatever? You do not have to put a value on them for this book, but that's what you would do in the salon is figure out how much value you place on that. Number 12 is inventory retail supplies. Retail supplies are the things we're going to have sitting out on a display that we can sell to our clients. And keep in mind that we never sell chemicals such as relaxers, colors, or permanent waves to our clients. Number 13 is prepare customer data cards. A customer data card doesn't have anything to do with our services whatsoever. This customer data card is to keep contact, contact information for your client. In other words, when a client first comes to you, you want to at least get their phone number at home and at work if they're employed. And the reason for that is when they call and make an appointment, you put their name on the appointment book. And if something comes up that you can't go to work today but you're booked, then you would um, send your husband or your child or your next door neighbor or somebody over there and say, please call my clients and tell them I won't be in today. If you can contact them, that's a lot better than having them show up at the salon and there's a note on the door that you won't be in today. A lot of cosmetologists prefer to um, have a space, and all I want is a blank card now with whatever information you're going to get. But a lot of cosmetologists prefer to get their mailing address too. And that is a good contact way, and it won't work if you're going to be out today. But what is good for if this client, you haven't seen them in three or four months, and you'd like for them to come back because there's a good client, and you don't have a clue why they left, drop them a card. Some people even get their birthday so they can acknowledge when their clients are having birthdays. And you might want to do that. So this card should be drawn up individually the way you want it. But don't fill it out because we're going to do that on number 34.
We'll make some more and fill in the information. All you're doing with this is preparing it so I'll know what kind of information you're looking for. Number 14, design and maintain other necessary records. This is where you put your service records in. The first necessary record you should have should be a release form. You may copy it right out of the book. That's fine with me. But have a release form. Have their medical record that goes in for a consultation. There's a copy of it in the book. Copy it off. Have a record for any permanent waves they get, for any chemical relaxer, and for any hair color service. And you may copy those right straight out of the book, but any chemical. There should also be a record for hair pressing services. Y'all have any questions on that one? Number 15, develop an inventory list. When you go to the grocery store, what do you put on your grocery list? Do y'all make a grocery list to take to the grocery store? What do you put on it? Whatever that you run out of. All right, tell me some things you run out of. Sugar. Or Sugar, um, milk, eggs. eggs. You hadn't given me any name brand, though. What kind um, of sugar do you buy? Dixie Crystals. You buy Dixie Crystals. But do you have to put Dixie Crystals on your shopping list to know what to get? You don't have to. Sugar is good enough. We don't care if you buy Borden or Pet Milk. Milk is good enough. So on your list... Make sure that you list everything that you may need in that salon. Shampoo, conditioner, setting lotion, setting gels, hairspray, bobby pins, all these things that we'll use and run out of. So what this is is a generic shopping list because we're fixing to open a salon and we don't have anything in it. So we just want to make us a general little generic list to go by. That's your inventory list. Number 16 is develop a needed items list. Y'all know how we do that. We keep it in the dispensary. As we get low on something, we go add it to the list. Now, on this needed items list, we need that Dixie crystals in front of sugar so we'll know what kind to buy. We can't just write down shampoo. we got to know if it's Matrix or Design Essentials or Ultimate. So write down all needed information. Make your needed items list extensive, that doesn't mean long, but include all your information because we're going to do number 18 is going to be complete a supply order and we should complete it off of develop a needed items list. Number 17 is organize a stock area. That's where I want you to actually draw me a dispensary with the cabinets and the drawers and show me what's in each one of them. You can do this with pencil and paper. It hadn't got to be to any specs. Just draw me one and show me where, where you're going to keep what. I just want to see if you know how to organize by putting your rods next to your permanent waves, your developer next to your color, your cleaning supplies with your sink. Number 18 is complete a supply order. Now go back to your needed items list. Decide how many bottles of the ultimate neutralizing shampoo you want to order, what size bottles, and how much they're going to cost you. And you want to put a cost on each thing because at the end you want to add them all up, add shipping and handling and taxes to your order, and give me a total of what your supply order is going to be. Number 19 is to demonstrate educating a client on services, products, and procedures. And there's no better time to educate a client on services than why you're giving services. And if you get somebody that's there for a haircut and um, shampoo and set and you start shampooing them and you notice they're having a lot of tangling or problem snarls in their hair, now's a good time to educate them on the product that you have that you're going to use on them to solve that problem. So while you're about to put it on there, explain to them what you're putting on there, what it will do, and how you put it on, how long you leave it on, and how you get it off the hair. Or do you leave it in, as in leave-in conditioners? So you have educated the client on services, products, and procedures. And later on, we're going to go down and, as a matter of fact, the next one, number 20, is sell products to clients. 
you can go back and refer to 19 and tell how you sold these products to your client. Because if you tell them all this and they're having the same problem at home and the product you used on their work to get rid of the tangles and snarls, aren't they probably going to want it? Yes, they're probably going to want to buy some of it. Then we're going to do number 21, identify principles which need to be applied in selling. One of those uh, principles is be tactful. You know, you don't want to push somebody around. You don't want to embarrass somebody if they don't have the money to buy. So you want to be very tactful. That's one of the principles. Another is to know when to quit selling. If they've already bought it, quit selling it. Because if you keep bragging on it and bragging on it and bragging on it, after a while, what's going to happen? They gonna, well, they're going to get tired of you, yeah. Are you going to keep on to your saying so much about it? Do you going to say something about it that it's not capable of performing? Mm -hmm. So know when to quit selling. In the book, there's a unit on uh, principles which need to be applied in selling. Number 22 is create a display of products for our service. Number 23 is answer a telephone properly. By now, hopefully, you have a name for your salon. And when you answer the phone, y'all know I've asked y'all to do this on the reception desk. Cosmetology department, Miss Braswell speaking. How may I help you? You want to identify where they've called. So therefore they know they've got the right number. Identify who you are so you bec become a person and not just a voice on the end of the phone. And by all means, make sure you let them know that you're there to serve them and help them. And do it all with a smile because they can hear the smile on the other end of that phone. Number 24 is operate an appointment desk. An appointment desk is not our reception area now. It's in the reception area. But an appointment desk is used for what? Answer the telephone. Make appointments. Change appointments. Collect money. Take the client back to their hairdresser. Sometimes check up the desk. And it kind of goes along with number 25, which is account for monies for services provided. Look at the word there, services. I only want you to tell me how are you going to keep up with what services Jane done and Susie done and Monica done. Because we got to keep that separate, but together, we got to keep it separate so we can pay them for it. We've got to keep it together so we'll know if our cash drawer uh, cash is out at the end of the day. Appointment book is a good place to write down when a client leaves outside of their name, put what they paid. Receipts are a good way to keep up with it, and so is the computer, entering them into the computer like we do out on our reception desk. Y'all know we check our tickets against what's on the computer and against the money to make sure we've got the right amount at the end of the day. Number 26 is maintain a reception area. Now we're actually talking about the reception area out there. Tell me about how you want to keep it clean, the restroom clean. Tell me if you're going to have magazines out there or if you're going to have a TV. Some salons are going now to where they have recorded some of what goes on in their salon, some of the services they're offering clients, and they put that VHS or DVD in and let that play on the camera for clients to sit there and watch. Are you going to have drinks and crackers? Are you going to have coffee? Are you going to have a play area for the children? And everybody should be different in the reception area. Number 27 is resolve customer complaints. Now, if you'll look down, you're going to see where it says on number 35, resolve client complaints. A customer is anyone who comes in your salon paying for a product or a service. A client is somebody you personally worked on. That's a person that you serviced. So when we're talking about a customer, their complaint may be about a, about a product they brought from you. It may be about, about one of your employees and they felt more comfortable coming to you than they did going to the employee. 
So think of a complaint. This should be done in the form of a conversation from where that customer contacts you and how you resolve that complaint. Number 28 is supervise personal and public sanitation. Personal sanitation are the steps you take every day to make yourself ready for work. Taking a bath, using deodorant, brushing your teeth, putting on freshly laundered clothing, so forth and so on. Public sanitation, a lot of them put, they keep the floors clean and the bathroom clean. But we do so much more in the salon for public sanitation. We cleanse and disinfect all the implements we use on our clients. We sanitize our countertops to help our public be safer. So think of all the ways you practice public sanitation. Number 29 is prepare an advertisement for a salon. An advertisement should be sh make sure you have the shop name, the hours of operation, the days of operation, the shop address, the shop telephone number, and the operators that work there. Make sure all of that is on your ad. If you would like to put a picture of yourself on the ad, get with me and I'll help you scan it on there. Number 30. Demonstrate selling of extra services and products. Now, if you go back to 19, you educated your client on some of these extra services and products. Refer back to it and now demonstrate how you sell some extra services and products that come back from your educating the client. Number 31 is visit so civic, church, social clubs, and places to promote your salon. Now, I'm not going to ask you to get out and do that because that's a little bit difficult to promote a salon when you're not even opening one yet. But write down how you would take care of all that. Number 32 is greet clients properly. When you have a client that comes in the salon, try to know their name. And I know that's difficult with walk-ins, but if they've made an appointment, you check that book for time for them to come in. Address them by Mr. or Mrs., their last name, until they tell you differently. Ask them how they are. Tell them you're going to take them back to work on them or let them know that you, it's going to be a couple of minutes before you can get to them. But greet them when they walk in the door. Number 33 is hold a client consultation. Don't put me the medical sheet in there and mark it as number 33. I want you to talk to this client, consult with this client. It should be a conversation. 34 is annotate the personal data cards, make you a few more, and now put people's names, phone numbers, or what other information. And I don't care if they're fictitious or real. Number 35 is resolve client complaint, complaints. Now, this is somebody you have worked on, and they're complaining about it. Think of some complaint and give me the resolution to it. Number 36 is schedule and or reschedule appointments to customer satisfaction. Make it a little difficult. Don't have Marie call and say she can't make her 4 o'clock appointment on Thursday and so she would like to come 4 o'clock on Friday. Don't just give her 4 o'clock. Make yourself think of ways we could change her when we know, you know, that, that we can't just... If you've been in the business for a little while, you're not going to have 4 o'clock on Friday open just because she wants it. So think of some way you would schedule and or reschedule to please that client. All right, do y'all have questions? I will put y'all a due date on your book on the board. I want y'all to think about it overnight and get with me tomorrow on what you'd like to do for your display. If you don't have any more questions, we'll work on our book now.